I, w- I wanted to welcome you to happy hour with Michelle uh-huh. and Phil. And uh, we, we were sitting last, uh, about a week ago, and we were having a conversation saying, you know, these we were at a trade show. Yep. And uh, we were saying, one of the things that uh, where, I, where I personally got the most from most of these events yep. was sitting around the, uh, the bar in the evening. Uh-huh. So one of the things we failed to do is we should have had a cocktail sitting up here, but um, well, that's for I next time. Same thing. I'm like, well, we're having happy hour without drinks. It's, <laughs> it's still, Sorry. it's happy because Don't Josh is here. It's happy because Josh is here. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> All right. So uh, the, the idea for this, this short discussions, it's sort of modeled off the conversation that we would have at the bar afterwards. And it was always when so I started in the industry 34 years ago. I think my first trade show was probably about 1990. And we'd go, yeah, we go sit and listen to the sessions. And then afterwards, we'd sit around the bar. Mm-hmm. I think I was just 21. So I spent a lot of time there. Um and we just have conversations about how you dry a hardwood floor or what you do with an adjuster that doesn't want to pay or you know, just general conversations about restoration. Okay. So I thought, here hey, here we are. <laughs> so uh, so with that, um, we're going to start. I'm going to introduce my guest, uh, Josh Hobbs. Hello. And uh, I'm going to give Josh the, 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 the microphone here for a minute. Uh-oh. And just, yeah, this will be easy. Just tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, how long you've been in the industry. And then we'll jump into some conversations here. So microphone. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so uh, my name is Josh Hobbs. I've been in the business pretty much my whole life. Grew up in it. My dad uh, and my uncle started a carpet cleaning back in the 80s or actually late 70s. And then in somewhere through the mid 80s, we uh, you know spawned and got into uh, restoration work like most of us did. And so I've I felt like I've, uh, you know, been in the business my whole life. I've had jobs or other jobs, you know, uh, you know, kind of when I was younger, going through high school and sort of outside of high school, but been in the business my whole life, started cleaning carpets, you know, went, worked in kind of pretty much every facet of the business. Um, and, uh, you know, restoration just kind of took off. It's better business than carpet cleaning. And, and so I've just sort of been at, you know, every different level of the restoration business since uh, I would say 99, okay. 1999. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so been been doing it for a while. Love it. Uh, working in a family business that is uh, it's ups and downs, you know, and uh, so it's been challenging some days, but it's 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 been a journey. And and uh, so the fun. family business, it's your father. Your yes. Brother. Mm-hmm. You have two brothers you know? No, I got a brother and my uh, other brother, who's actually my sister. No, she's um, um, no, my brother has a twin sister They're twins. Right. My sister's the smartest one in the family because she works in the business part-time and she never comes up to the office so she's quite wise she's definitely smarter than us has a degree me and my brother don't we're knuckleheads and and uh yeah so yeah we have our our our, our fun days but it's it's uh, we've been able to uh uh manage it pretty well probably you hear horror stories and and you know you know reality tv shows and so forth that that show you definitely stuff that goes on i'd imagine in every family business but um we've been able to make it work somehow i don't know how but it just well, so no let's dig into that just a moment because i like this this discussion your family business mm-hmm. what are the what are the key like give me two keys to success in a family business so uh the, the probably the biggest thing that would wreck not just any family business, but business ego, right? And so really we have to keep our egos in check, or at least I do, uh, finger pointing, right? And so really we just kind of, you know, it's it's hard and, and we're not perfect at it, but, you know, the humility of it is, is uh is a big deal. And, you know, I, we're, I'm grateful because I feel like that's sort of like just who I am. You know, I'm not going to sit here and call myself a humble person, right? Cause a humble person wouldn't do that. But like, I feel like, um, I feel like, you know, just through my upbringing, my environment or whatever, you know, since we were kids, we've just sort of, uh, kept egos aside and, and that really helps, you know, us get through and, you know, situations and whatnot. So I'm curious with the landscape of the industry, you're part of fleet response now. Yes. So how did you make that decision? What was that transition like? Uh, great. Right. So we weren't really in the position to, um, um, sell, I'd say. And so we weren't like, we didn't have like a for sale sign on the door and anything like that. I don't really know. It just kind of happened. Right. So like Mark Springer is the, was the first one. And so I'm close to Mark. I respect Mark and like, um, you know, so I sat down with them and he, you know, after he, you know, did their deal and sat down with them and we've been getting phone calls forever. We just never really, you know, um, thought much of it. But then when Mark came, 
you know, like 75% of like probably the trust that I would have to build with anyone that we would sell to was sort of already like, I just know that he would have uh, uh, probably asked all the right questions and probably more, more questions that I would even know to ask. And so there was a lot of trust there. So that kind of was like maybe the tipping point. So having those discussions and then getting to meet the, the folks at fleet and just kind of sharing, you know, their vision and what they want to do. And it just kind of made sense for us. And so we never really had a clear succession plan being in a family owned business. And so, um, you know, me and my brother would go to my dad and, and, and knock the door and say, we got to talk about this. And we never really, you know, talked about it, which is probably not uncommon or unique. And so for, for the whole fleet thing, the way we, we, we were able to, uh, um, do it, it just made this, it just, it just kind of all came together organically. I'd say, you know what I mean? Yep. Like, and it, it, it just wasn't there a, intention behind it it just kind of happened that way and it worked out for all of us so you can kind of see a trend with fleet companies right yeah 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 so you know all the companies are kind of the same similar generational you know uh yeah exactly so it, it kind of just speaks to that for sure so how can you hear me okay yeah <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so really, just a quick question: that um, how how did that fundamentally did, did it change your job at all, or is it pretty much same? You just the the paycheck comes from somewhere else, or did it change what you do and what your role is? Yes and no. Um, so you know, being in a family business, right? It's it's hard to um, we we always talk about growth, right? And we've grown over the years. And it's really just through paying more money for advertising or or Google. And so and then doing good work, good quality work. Right. So like those, I think if you do those pretty well, like you're going to grow naturally. But there was never really like we always talked about growth. But we never like sat down and said, OK, let's be intentional about growth, um, whether that's through opening other locations or just more more of a financial investment into growth. We've always sort of have talked about those things, but weren't really smart enough to like do them we probably would be okay but we 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 uh we just never did and so with us my roles are the same we're still doing the same things as we did the 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 day before but now we're a lot more strategic in growth and now we're doing some of those things that we've always sort of talked about and and really the you know it takes time to do those things we only have so much time you know, and so it. What the, the beauty of it is now we're actually acting out and really putting the pen to the paper on being strategic and intentional about growth in other markets, other places, and and then with all the bandwidth of or with all the the brain power within the group, it's just uh, it's nice to be able to like be able to talk to folks that are under the same flag on like how do we do this that have had success doing it so. Okay, yeah, this we're gonna change directions for just a moment. We're at the RIA show here in Reno, Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, so you have been involved in a leadership positions with RIA over the, the last uh, I don't know, five years, probably. What is it? Uh, first of all, what do you think about the direction of RIA? And what is the key to keep to, to maintain that success? And what do you see as the, the future? And, and that was a really long, complicated question. So you can package it up in a short answer. But uh, so just kind of your synopsis on the show, the event, the direction and the future of RIA. So, yeah, that's a lot there. That is, there's like a lot of questions, right? So like, I'm excited about the uh, the growth and in, in, uh, the, the RIA. It's funny, everyone keeps walking up and they don't realize they see a microphone. It's kind of weird. So like. Yeah, like I feel like should I put the microphone down and it's like weird. It's like this odd moment. No. Yeah. Or like maybe when they come up, I'll just see. Look, look, speed. Look, look, look. You got to get on the. Do it. This is uh, this is my younger brother. It's your younger brother. Yeah. Greg, Greg Dillon. Yeah. Say hi. Oh, hi. Where are we at? I don't even yeah. know. Yeah. Well, see, he didn't even realize he was on camera. He just came down and started singing. Oh, yeah. I was singing a heartbeat. I was singing a heartbeat. <laughs> Glad to be here. Hi, Michelle. Okay, uh, they probably won't know who that. that. <laughs> so we're getting phone calls and everything like that. You know, so. Yeah, yeah I do. I do. We're going off the real She's saying, congrats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited about the future of the RAA. Right. And so, um, um, you know, a lot of it was leadership under Mark coming in there with Katie and everything. So it's just, uh, um, yeah, I'm excited, you know, like, I think that, you know, we need to have an association that's strong. So I, I support like the, the idea, right. Like this, we have to have an associate strong and, and fights and really, you know, talks and speaks to the restores. And so like, it's, it's pretty, you know, and so like I wanted to be, you know, I've, I've been on the you know board for for a while. Don't give me I don't even know how many years, but a couple <laughs> years. And so, um, yeah, so it was uh, it was a good opportunity for me. Now, it seems like there's a whole lot more interest for folks to come on. Like you could when I got on the board, like I would never get on the board now just to say that. Right. Like back when I got on, I had like they had to beg me. Right. And so um, looking back, I'm fortunate to have uh, and grateful for sure to be able to get on it and work through some of the stuff you, you wouldn't imagine all of the back end work on, on in, in an association where you're volunteering your time, it takes to uh, really get the needle moving. And it almost feels like then, you know, like in, in, in my, in my normal business, I want to move the needle way faster. Right. But like when you start talking about committees and all that, those words it just slows down things, but I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for it. And so I appreciate it. You need a happy hour story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. So we, in this industry, we're working in people's houses. We're, we're in their business. We're working 24 hours a day and that gives the opportunity for a lot of crazy things to happen. So you're down in Texas, which means there's really crazy things going on. And I just love to hear some story that comes to mind when you say, man, that was just, I can't believe that happened to me. Yeah. So there's a lot there. I've been doing it a while. So I've been into some situations. So I, uh, you ever dried wine cellars? No. Yeah, I have. I tried to dry them from the inside of the bottle out. Wow. Right. Well, so that so I've done that too without drinking. So yeah, I the first a couple of things come to mind is I've had a couple scenarios. I think you'd learn from the first one, but don't put dehumidifiers in a wine cellar because the corks <laughs> need to remain moist. And so I've uh I remember yeah. Yeah, a couple times too. As I had some guys, you know, those big wine bottles are like really yeah, tall, like yeah. they look super expensive. I've had a guy drop one of those in front of a customer. And then when I went to find it, you can't buy them anymore. So that's an odd conversation. And then I've uh, gone into a wine cellar in a really nice home. Cause if you have a wine cellar in your home, right? Like it's nice, yeah. right? And so, like, I've gone into a wine cellar where all the, where all the bottles, all the, the wine, all of the wine was on the ground because we had dehumidification going on down there and we dried out all the cork bottles and literally opened up every single wine bottle. So that's another conversation like that is not very fun to have taken part of. So, yeah, so those are the two ones that I remember feeling probably the most uncomfortable list, right? Or if that's a word, it's uncomfortable yeah, it's a word. One. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, those were those were two that I've, I've I've always talked about. And so, like, you know, I've been on some large loss situations where where, uh, you know, we've had some interesting, uh, interesting time. So I'd, I'd have to think about a lot of it, probably a lot of it. I can't even probably speak onto the, the microphone. It'd be more of a candid discussion behind the. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I did hear some of those last night. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. You're the first guest on our on our new show. So we really appreciate you coming by. Thanks yeah. for stopping in. Hey. Travel yeah. safe. And um, you get to yeah. the next guest in. There you go. Warner Cruz. Warner. Warner Cruz. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Josh. Look it. And just like that, we make mm. a change. Warner Cruz, JC. I just ate something, so I have a little toothpick. I was working on it. Okay, good. Okay, good. Lock it out. Edit it. So, yes. <laughs> I love Okay, so so later in this discussion, you can think about it while we're just chatting here. Okay. You're going to tell us some crazy, funny story that happened from restoration. We'll close on that one. Crazy, but restoration yeah, but story. yeah, no, you have to you have to wait on that. You can't answer now. I know exactly. Think um, so. So you missed the introduction. So the concept here is we think that a lot of great conversations from the restoration events happen at the cocktail party afterwards. Oh, yeah. And so I thought, hey, you know, talk about those things right yeah, now. we can a little <laughs> bit. I mean, so, you know, I learned a lot about restoration business sitting at the bar, mm -hmm. talking to really good people like Warner Cruz and Josh Hobbs and and uh, great people are just so open and sharing. And that's just a time to 
have a conversation. You talk about family and you talk about business and all that. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about business. And, okay. uh, but quick, give us a quick overview, you know, introduction to Warner Cruz. Who are you? And um, give us a couple minutes on where you came from in the industry, how long you've been doing this. And then we'll jump into some topical discussions. Wow. Okay. So Warner Cruz, uh, live in Chicago. Our company was JC Restoration, started by my parents 40 years ago. And we, on December 3rd of last year, sold to Blue Sky Restoration Contractors out of uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, we are four months into this transition. And every morning I wake up and say, I, I just I just thank God. It's, an, it's been an unbelievable uh, transition. Um, and to be honest, it hasn't been easy. I mean, change is hard when your people are used to doing things a certain way. And and now all of a sudden they're forced to do something else. It's, it's been a little painful, uh, but we're going to get through it. It's all good. Um, my parents started in restoration. They worked for a company called help services in the seventies. They had an opportunity to buy, uh, their company in 82. Uh, they wanted my sisters and I to go to college and never do this type of work. They wanted us to be doctors and lawyers and, and not cleaning up toilets and sucking up water. So that's what we did. We all did our thing. I, I lived in Japan for three years. I have an international business degree uh, in Japanese. I speak a minor in Japanese. Arigatou gozaimasu. And, uh, but I, I've forgotten. It's been too long. You give me some Sapporo beer, I will start speaking Japanese. And uh, came back because I was worried about my parents. You know, their broken language, the dealing with insurance companies, um, my dad would say he was fine. My mom would worry about my dad. So I came back to try to sell their business. And when I tried to sell their business, I realized nobody wants to buy a company that has beat up trucks, no technology, no marketing plan. So I joined DKI, uh, which is a network of contractors. And I got to travel and see other people's companies, which is what the RIA is all about, getting to know other people and going and seeing other people's companies. And I realized Wow, this is a great industry. You can actually make some money in this industry. And, um, and actually, it was you guys that introduced us to DKI. Yeah. The business mentors introduced us. I was thinking yeah. that DKI, yeah. Mark, uh, Mark uh, Valentino yeah. told us about you. So business mentors came in and started to organize my business, started to help me understand margins, started to realize where... Uh, things in our company that were important, like I could share the secret, yes. the last person in any restoration company that should be collecting money <laughs> is the owner. We are too emotionally tied to that money. Uh, finding a bookkeeper or somebody that collect, make those collections is the, one of the best things that you can do. It's free yeah. advice, right? There you go. Comes yeah, from the business advice. mentors. So fast forward, we continue to grow. Large loss was something that I love to do travel with a team of people and uh, we're blessed to be in a big city in Chicago, and with the current um, market today of acquisitions and mergers, we were very lucky to be in Chicago and uh, sought after as an independent company, a big one in, in Chicago. So I count my blessings every day. This industry has done nothing but bless my family, and as far as the RA will keep me on the board or, or keep me in leadership, I all I want to do is help other companies, I want to help them grow because what this industry has done for me and my family is, is unbelievable. Wow. That was too much. No, it was not too much. Congratulations on getting on the board. Yeah. That is very well deserved. You're a perfect person to be on the board. So I'm curious what you thought of this year's convention. I mean, it's been big and vibrant and so many people. So I'm curious what you thought of the convention this year. The props have to go to Mark Springer. Absolutely. Mark Springer, uh, we met when he was super young. Yep. I took my CR course with his dad. His dad introduced Mark when he was very young. And he always he was always passionate about politics. And yep. he always was passionate about networking. And one of the things he always talked about is we are so fragmented. We Somebody needs to put this group together to help each other. And he actually did that. And when he came into power, how many years back? It was a mess. And now the success of this show, the people that want to be a part of it, the enterprise sponsors, the, the amount of people that want to be on the board. I mean, it is a testament to Mark, 
and he's the most humble guy. He'll tell you it's everyone else, <laughs> but you need a leader. And he's been a great leader and uh, we're grateful to Mark and the board. And what we want to do is we want to continue this momentum by bringing us together, big and small, help continue, bring us together as an industry. Perfect. Hey, so, uh, so I know a lot about your company, but when I think about things that are unique to what you do, the first one is large loss. And the second one is company culture. And I'm going to dig into each one of those just a little bit brief discussion. So, um, First, let's talk about large loss and let's say, okay, just from that perspective, uh, large loss is basically something that requires lots of uh, uh, resources and skills. And it could be a $20,000 loss for some people. And it could be a 200,000 or $2 million loss for somebody else. So just, and this is really tough because I'm gonna say, give us some advice on how people should set up their business or handle the job that's large for them. What, what are the best advice that you would give them? Okay, again, what you told you remember what large loss you defined large loss large loss is nothing but a bunch but a bunch of small losses put together in one I believe we had that conversation one you night. stayed up with me all night <laughs> on my first large loss you helped me all night get through it because i thought i couldn't do it i thought there was something really complicated and magical it's not and what i will tell you and what i'm passionate about is organization as you get bigger your biggest threat in your organization is the small mom and pop shop that is working out of a small 3000 square foot facility because we're both charging the same prices. Mm -hmm. But as a big company, you have a greater chance of failing. If you're not organized, you don't know your costs, and you're not efficient at what you do. Large loss is about being efficient. It's about uh, managing your cost, your materials to do a job, manage your labor, be productive, uh, and then know how to build. And if you do all of those things with integrity and, and, and you do it the right way without trying to gouge anyone, you'll succeed. And I think that's one of the reasons why we succeeded because we helped a lot of companies when we were called in as support, we helped them bill. No one was greedy. We tried to make sure the bill was justifiable and everyone won. Yeah. And uh, this industry, we all know if we're in it, we realize it's a profitable business, but the people that are trying to gouge our clients, our, cons our insurance companies, they're going to fail and eventually they're going to be, they're going to be discovered. So uh, large loss, it, start from the beginning. If you're a small company, my advice is always buy the same type of air movers, buy the same type of dehumidifiers. If you find an auction or you find a company that's liquidating, buy all of, if it's a great deal, buy all of them and then sell them and buy more of the same type of equipment you have, because then you can replace parts easily. You'll only have to buy one type of casters, one type of filters. Uh, when you start smaller and you start organizing that way, as you get bigger and you will get bigger, if you're good at being efficient and you're going to get bigger, people are going to realize that you know what you're doing. Next thing you know, you have a fleet of equipment vehicles. And uh, if, if you just buy hodgepodge, it, it's difficult to remain consistent. So um, a couple of things that, that I just would think I'd add to that. The first one is good systems. Make sure you're, you're a systemized company. Second one is know where your money's coming from and don't take the risk there. You could lose, you could lose everything on one job if you did that wrong. So the, the last question, well, I'm going to ask you two more questions, the, but the last serious question here is uh, tell me, you have a great company culture. And what were the keys to creating a solid company culture that gets discretionary effort from your employees and really ties your whole team together? So tell me about your company culture and, and was it a deliberate process to create it? And if you can kind of sum that up in a, in a, in a shorter answer, but there yeah. you go. I talked too much. Shorter Sorry. Answer. No, shorter answer than my question. My question was super long. So you know, okay. So in, and, and I don't want to offend anyone. I know my Latino culture and in my Latino culture, respect is one of the most important things. Of course, we all want to make more money, but treating each other with respect, uh, a simple greeting in the morning of good morning is extremely important. Mm -hmm. The culture in our organization, we don't fire texts at 730 in the morning saying, I need you to be here or do this or this. It's good morning. How you feeling? Hope you're feeling well. Can you please do me a favor? And then you ask. You create that culture, all of a sudden there's a level of respect that people enjoy being around and they appreciate it when they end up leaving your company and uh, they end up leaving your company and working for somebody else. They start to realize that that little thing made a big difference. Uh, the other thing um, that I think culture wise, we try to be consistent with fairness. Um, 
in our society today, it seems like a lot of behavior, a lot of dress, a lot of jokes, off color jokes are becoming acceptable or doing and saying type uh, things are acceptable because our kids don't have to call our our adults by their last uh, Mr. Or Mrs. by their last name. Those little things to me are very important. It creates a culture that we want to be different. Mm -hmm. And when you create a culture that's positive, that says we want to be different, uh, you engage and you bring people in and say, we are different. Let's 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 have some pride that's at another level. I think it creates a cool group that says we're part of something special. Okay. Do you have do you have any questions? I was going to ask you one more question because you have the most amazing facility, right? Anybody who's seen JC's facility, wow, a hundred thousand square feet. Is that how big it is? Yeah. Okay. So there have to be some lessons in this as other people are scaling up their business and building their dream facilities. What have you learned about building your dream facility? Good question. Thank you. Don't do it. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, when I was younger, I was in a 13,000 square foot facility. Phil helped me with my large loss team. We, we grew the organization and we were extremely profitable and I did not worry, but it was my ego that said, I want to be bigger. And I would see other companies. I want to be bigger. I want to be bigger. I want to be on the highway. I want to have land. And we bought that building. And in 2008, we closed 2000, no, in 2008, we, we, we were building it. We closed, we were building it. And as you all remember in 2009, the, the, oh, yeah. it crashed and it was extremely scary. What I will tell people, and every time people come through, we've been deemed as the Taj Mahal of restoration. And I tell people, the key to this game is to remain lean and mean. Uh, overhead, big buildings, uh, although it's a nice ego thing, be smarter than that be profitable. You could be so much more flexible. You could do so much more with your company. And, and when opportunities pop up, you can take them much quicker than a company that has a lot of overhead to worry about. My building and the monster that we created is never well-fed. It's always hungry. So you have to keep uh, feeding it. Um, so that was that's the first uh, recommendation. The other thing that I worried about, and uh, a building my size, I could tell the secret, uh, a few years back, I decided to sell it and lease it back because I had a friend of mine that passed away and they owned a really big building and his wife didn't know what to do with it. And it was, and I started thinking about my building. My building is designed for a big restoration company and my wife would have to find the perfect restoration company to want to buy my building. And that's not easy. Right. So having a building that's smaller that is designed so that it's, it could be put back on the market mm -hmm. quick enough. I have a contents division. I could have put a 5,000 square foot facility to handle just my contents. I could have housed a lot of my trucks in a different facility. I could have had three or four. As much as we all want to be under one roof, uh, as an owner, you have to think about the end game and how to get out of those big assets if you had to in an emergency basis. Okay, well, as promised, this tell me tell me a crazy restoration story something that you know we're in people's homes we're working 24 hours a day we're, we're working their business and uh, you know we encounter strange things or funny things we have cr crazy crazy recommendations from a client or something so what comes to mind oh my gosh i am on the spot i want to put this on because i have good ones but i just can't remember okay um I would say, wow, wow. Know, appropriate for all audiences though. Right? Yeah, I'm trying to think of, well, there's so many of, we've worked with so many people. I'd hate to embarrass people or say, I don't want to do. Okay, I think that uh, a crazy story that we've had was on a large loss that we went out of town. Uh, it was during hurricane, boy, it was in Utica. And Punta Gorda. Oh, okay. And we are, and it was, I had to get the urge of large loss out of my system. So back in Chicago, I remember Dale Saylor wished us off. He was the president of DK at the time, wished us off. We, I, I rented every uh, compressor, generator, anything that my trailers could pull. We would, uh, we, we hitched. We loaded every cube truck. I had nothing big, just cube trucks, vans, and pickup trucks. And we caravan down to Florida. Uh, I was driving in front and had 13 trucks behind me. We were driving and uh, 
I said, we're going to go all the way through. We are probably, we were probably in Georgia. And as many of you know, if you're coming from the Midwest, once you get to Georgia, uh, it gets dark and it gets creepy when you're entering Florida. And I remember it was about two in the morning. We were starting to fall asleep. I mean, people were tired. We had these radios that we were trying to keep talking to each other. Hey, everyone. Okay. Kept looking back at the trucks, realizing that every time we stop for gas, it's a big ordeal. And that was a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden I realized there was a camper in front of us that was out like half out on the road. And I grabbed my radio to try to tell everybody. And it fell next thing you know, I'm turning and I'm just watching all my trucks behind me. I see lights, I see cars and I'm thinking, this is it. We're going to lose so many. So it was the scariest moment ever. And after we came back is when I ordered three semis with tractors and a bus. Yeah. Cause I said, it's one thing doing great work on a cat down in Florida from Chicago. You got to get there safely yes. yeah. and yes. people can't be exhausted and you can't put yeah. people at risk because it's our, it's their kids and, yeah. and wives that are looking to us to get them back home safe. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. You want to wrap us up? Sure. I don't think I have anything else. Warner, thank you so much. This was a pleasure as always. And congrats on the board. Congrats on the sale of your company. It was very exciting to break that news and help with that. Watley is next. Do you know Watley? Can you go yeah. tap him in? Him yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, that was, that, that, that wasn't even a funny story. That would have been really scary. That would have been to, really, you know, to, really to, scary. Your convoy crashes on the way to a large loss. I, I would, I, yes, it ended well. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Warner just checked Watley's teeth. I would like to go on yeah, yeah, record for that. Yeah, that's a friend. a friend. That is a friend right but there. It was weird. They started picking this stuff out of the teeth. That was <laughs> yes. All right. So Phil and I decided that a podcast would be really fun because if it's related to happy hour, although we realized we don't have drinks, we didn't plan this well for the debut, that's but it's, well, it's meant to be kind of like a happy hour type conversation, more relaxed. Right. But I want to start by having you introduce yourself and where did the Hey Watley thing come from? Okay. What is this right now? Are we like live? I, I, no. It's being recorded. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, Wadley, like I, I think a lot of us, uh, maybe high school football, high school baseball, there was three marks on the team. Coach is like, this is impractical. <laughs> so Wadley, get over there, go run a lap. I was always in trouble. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, that's probably the genesis carried on through college. And uh, I think that that became more prevalent or necessary useful, like with actionables, it started to have maybe more of a national presence. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of marks in this room right now, right? And so if you are born in the 80s, that is the first or second most popular name, all right? It's like an Aiden of today, right? right? So anyhow, a lot, a lot of marks out there. So it just kind of made sense. I think Harrison started calling me that and then he became Harrison and I became Watley and you know, so on. I think that was the genesis mm -hmm. of it. So talk about your background in the industry. Uh, let's see here. So started out, I mean, really you have to go back to like not having a lot of wealth being in the trades. Like if you want to make money and you're 14 years old, you do asbestos abatement with no PPEs. Uh, okay. So I did a lot of that. Um, I was a Saturday asbestos group, but don't tell my dad. Yes, I, right. But well, he knew it. I don't know. He directed it. Yeah, somehow I plowed through all that chrysotile <laughs> asbestos that's coursing through my veins. Um, I started a painting company in high school. Yeah, I had like three trades people working for me and like was actually had kind of a business. It was called uh, Mark's Painting and my business card said uh, walls, ceilings, baseboards and more ellipsis. Uh, my my like branding wasn't on point like at 15. But uh, yeah, it, it, I wish I still had that card. Um, so I was like in the trades, right? And when I went to college, instead of working for TGI Fridays, I worked for two big builders and we were doing the ADA expansions, American Disability Act. And so I would like run my crews and I could do maths, rise and run. And so we did a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the ramp systems for like bungalows for uh, schools. That was like a big thing in San Diego. And so I just developed you know, some idea of how to build there. And out of school, I went into finance. I got a signing bonus to go into a private equity firm a school and thought that's how I was probably going to make my money. But I found the work. Um, it paid well, uh, but it was unfulfilling, Michelle. Like we were just moving around numbers and it was, it wasn't even VC stuff. It was like private equity money. Like you're just 
moving around money. You have no real connection to what the brand promise is, what the product is going to be, no, no real innovation. So, you know, that firm uh, wound down and I worked at the holding company level and got a nice severance of which I was grateful for. I found that refreshing. And I was like, okay, well, wait a minute, a um, couple of bucks in my pocket. And I also was a child of like 2007 financial crisis, right? In finance. So I was really sensitive to like, okay, what has an inverse relationship to the economy? And so I really pretty pragmatically, you're probably used to asking that question. Like, oh, I stumbled into it. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I would give myself a little bit of credit of like being a little pragmatic about like, okay, I think this industry is, looks interesting and it reconciles with my core competencies of building. And I've just been able to wed that with some of my learned biases towards technology and finance. And so uh, here we are. And ever since I've just been trying to solve uh, big problems in the industry, um, not seeking big profits, not thinking first about the money, thinking first about like, where is a pain point? Yeah. And since I care deeply about the folks in this room, I know the way that you do, Phil, the way that you do, Michelle, like how can I solve problems for them? And so that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And that's why you guys see me fire up something new every two years. Exactly, serial Yeah, per perhaps. Um, and my wife's not happy with these decisions. <laughs> I think that we would have both uh, more money and more time if I didn't fire something up new every two years, but I can't help myself. Uh, and I think that's just part of who I am and perhaps always going to be that way. It's like, uh, it's to be my full self, I would need to be trying to solve really tough problems. I wouldn't be as available emotionally to my kids or my wife unless I had the freedom to 60 hours a week, try to solve these tough problems and then have the feeling of like, oh, I'm getting somewhere, yeah. right? It's it's really, and that's, I'd see it in both of you guys, right? You can relate. Yes. Okay, yeah. all right. So anyhow, that was probably wildly longer than no, what you wanted yeah, from me. It's shorter than one of my questions, it's okay. <laughs> Here, the back. No. So, so you own a restoration company, right? So amongst everything else, but you, you have a restoration company, you got five different things. We'll talk about, probably go down one of those paths, but uh, tell me about your restoration company. Uh, so I actually sold my full service GC shop, which helped me capitalize some of the other brands. What happened in 2011, I became a certified trainer. I don't know how John Glitzmeyer at Veris like duped me into doing that. I don't even know Phil, like why I became a trainer, but what happened was I started like training my competitors in my market and this was before Actionable Insights was ever founded. It was like, okay, let's just all sit around and talk about like what would be warranted if a glue down flooring was installed or a high grade shower surround, what would be included? So we'd have slides and we'd like go through what line items and so on. And what happened was I developed all this relationship with my competitors and was operating from a spirit of abundance. I thought it more practical, Phil, to just be a subcontractor because when I fired up emergency packout co, cause I couldn't find anybody to do contents credibly. I was like, okay, well, they'll fire up emergency packout co. The, the business stumbled a bit for the first 10 months because KIC restoration was growing so much that we were winning work that the people wanted in town. And I realized like, okay, it's just gonna be more practical to be a subcontractor mm -hmm or a vendor for yeah. these relationships I already have. So I sold off my interest in KIC and then uh, Emergency Packout Co is my most like restore centric, you know, brand where we do packouts throughout California and bias the private client ecosystem. Okay. So uh, that's that brand. Pretty simple, simple business in some sense, but it's also, difficult and I can observe that through the people that have come behind us mm -hmm. and tried to copy and fail it must not be that easy um, and I would say the margins aren't as attractive as they were when I was full service especially on the mid side like, if you're billing honestly I, I don't think that you will find outsized margins with contents work it's worth doing if you're good at it and you can keep your breakage below uh, say two and a half percent. We're sub one percent. We have been for the last three years, but I think that's probably industry leading breakage rates. You know, your gross 
profit against what you're writing down for breaking. You want to keep that sub 2.5. If you're more than 5%, I don't think you should be in that business. Right. You won't find it fun. Well, and I think the other part about it is a lot of people, a lot of people don't really apply their indirect costs on that. So you get all this, uh, the, the, the warehouse and the vehicles and everything else. And so they look at their direct costs and think they're making a boatload of money. And then they realize at the end of the day, they're really not. So I'm assuming that, uh, that those are things you take into consideration. Uh, I, I suppose that is absolutely true. I, I, I look you in the eye. I'm like, Phil, how many people in this room think they're making money? And then you work with them and you look at their books and you help assess, assess it out. And you're like, guys, you're trying to make it up on volume. And it's the biggest lie ever told to the restore. Um, I, yeah, we think a lot about that. But I, I would say that the business is interesting, but I don't want to posture like it's that interesting it it pays me a salary right and i'm grateful for i only have to work on the business about an uh one day a month and so for that i am grateful but there's it's not throwing off distributions and cash it's like it's doing its thing i i think when we get to 20 million dollars in gross revenues because of our ability to centralize estimating and leverage geospatial data we'll be able to capture efficiencies where it, the business will become more interesting, but it's a good lesson for me. And it allows me to like credibly look Fulton in the eye and talk about margins. Cause I'm like, folks know we're good operators, Michelle. And it's not actually, I'm not making money hand over fist. It's a tough business and things go wrong often. And if you're a noble operator, you're going to have to make good on that. And uh, that will eat up margin quickly. So Okay, so you had a great conversation with Mike Fulton on stage, hour and a half long conversation earlier today at the RA show. So I'm curious what you think the biggest takeaway from that conversation is, the biggest nugget from Fulton today. It didn't occur to me as to be the biggest nugget, but the after action review as I walked around the floor with several folks that I, I really respect, um, the fact that Mike Fulton was willing to go on record and, and talk about margin instead of markup was transformative. I, I've not seen that from the Veris side of the house and to be willing to call out that 40, 45% margin, which is almost hundred percent markup is, is suitable. And that's something that we should strive for as restorers and also passively guides the behavior of their pricing department. That's an individual, Mike Fulton, who believes it's not a crime for restorers to be profitable and sees value in restorers being solvent for his carrier partners. And he understands he can't, he needs to create an environment where we can be solvent and profitable. That's gonna create the best claim outcomes. Otherwise he's not gonna say that. I didn't, I didn't expect him to necessarily say what he said, but I think uh, he alluded to that with you, Michelle, initially, and then will really double down on it today as to talk about margin. So it's all ambiguity was out of it. It's like, okay, it's not a crime to, to be profitable. Um, so I, I think that was the biggest takeaways I walked around the room for the last couple hours. Uh, your, your thought, what was the biggest takeaway? I think that was... I think that was probably the biggest one. Yeah, when I was on the, doing the podcast with him, I was also surprised that he was that open about number and profits and all that. So I think that the industry has come a long way in these conversations, right? Like Mike has said a lot over the last few years, and I feel like we're making steps forward. And um, so I don't know. We'll see. Are we ready for the fun part? Sure. Well, no, the, here's the, here's the, I just want you to tell me really quickly about your actionable insights company and what you're doing with that. And the, the, the reality that you started off by saying, I'm not making a lot of profit because I'm a nonprofit company. All of these people walking around here think they're for profit. You acknowledge that you're not for profit. And what does that mean and why? Okay. So actionable. Remember I was talking earlier about like, I was inviting all my competitors to my warehouse, right? Uh, we realized at some point that maybe it could be more and should be more. And so um, we formed a 501c6. It's the same tax structure as the RAA. Okay. And I think the reason we did it to be really honest about it is we tried to appoint farmers and Nat Gen, National General, Nat Gen Premier, to the board but their employment agreement wouldn't allow them to participate unless it was a nonprofit. Okay. And so then I went back to somebody who is still on the board today, which is the deputy attorney general and a, a friend of mine in San Diego. And so they 
ultimately we're like, hey, well, 501c6 gives us nonprofit that works for the carrier side of the house. Because what we wanted to do, Phil, was so much different than what had ever been done before. We're like, we can't just issue standards about what's reasonable and customary and pricing unless we can get the carrier to buy into it. And so Actionable's always had this weird nuanced role that's not dissimilar to Mike Fulton's role at, at Fair Risk. It's like, I've got two masters that have diametrically different ways of making money on my board. Any move I make, if I get out of line, Michelle, I go, I go full, full Ed Cross, full Ben Justison, my board's going to leave in droves, right? And so uh, we've got to be nuanced in our, our communication and what we publish and so on. But the, the nonprofit was just an outcome of like such an organic fill. Like we never intended actionable to be bigger than San Diego. Yeah. We never intended it to be just 40 contractors getting together, talking about their hardship with carriers. But when carriers started showing up to the meetings, we weren't even going out of our way. Like all of a sudden there'd be like 15 adjusters. We're like, okay, what do we do with you? And so you want to participate in this conversation? Cool. Uh, so now what? And everything just happened because I was kind of pushed in that direction. And so ultimately, with the appointment of Seth Harrison as executive director. Two years ago, he took the reins of it. I don't have operational control anymore. I just sit at the board level and try to provide guidance, not dissimilar to Katie Smith and, and uh, how she works at, at the board level. But Christy operationally as a CEO is like running the business, right? Um, so Phil, hopefully actionable consumes less and less of my time uh, moving forward. And I create more and more space for really capable people like Martin and Harrison to run with it. So, so there, there's two things. First of all, I think your wife probably agrees with that too, based on your earlier conversation. She might like to take a vacation every now and then. Uh, that's not a trade show. Yeah. And the, <laughs> no doubt. I've tried that. Not a client visit. That wobbly, wobbly yeah. outcomes on bringing wives to the trade shows. The other thing is I like that we just turned Ed Cross into a verb. Yeah, that's okay. Thing. So somebody yeah, he's earned that. <laughs> yeah. Most a lot of, would have uh, would agree. Yeah. yeah. So so the last thing we're just going to wrap up here, and I'm going to hit you because I didn't warn you with this one before. But being in restoration, we're in and out of people's houses all the time. We get into crazy situations. I don't know if you have a crazy story from some restoration job that you were ever on, or could have been a remodeling project. Just just something that was surprising, funny, or interesting that you might want to share. Mm. I don't know where I'm going with this one just yet. Hmm. A crazy, funny story in restoration. Well, as I think about emergency pack out co one of the oddest jobs was up in San Francisco it was one of the first jobs we ever did. And Michelle was at a point where the business was so small, like they flew me up there to like close the deal. <laughs> like, you know, cause we didn't really have anybody that could handle like six figure pack outs and so on. And I'm not sure I could, but we were the best we had. Yeah. So anyhow, we went up there and what had happened was a water heater. Uh, it was a tankless water heater, which made it worse. Um, it ran a major pipe failure i mean catastrophic failure and it ran for three weeks um and uh, it was an elderly couple um and they were on vacation and so they only found out like and shut off the water the neighbors saw the water pouring out like one of the windows like oh my gosh i think it was a sliding glass door window but you get what i'm saying like huge copious amounts of water and i'd never seen anything like it because the heat from the hot water had basically coated the walls and ceilings in microbial growth, the likes of which we had never seen. And so um, this particular case was really odd in that there was that much mold and you would think total loss, all the contents, not true. This is like a $20 million house. We've got Renoir's there. We've got sign. I learned about a Steinway. I didn't know what that was, a piano, yeah. right? And the piano was all buckled. Like, can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, and it was like, we were definitely kicking out of our coverage. Um, but this particular case, like a trial by fire, Michelle, we learned a whole lot uh, about how to get an art curator involved and how to do our best to restore that art, know when to call in an expert and 
uh, this was always approached as very having very sentimental value. The policyholders were like 75. So they just cared deeply. It wasn't like a policyholder in the 30s that are like, just write me a check. Like, I'd rather go to Restoration Harbor. I'm good. Like, they were like, you got to restore this stuff. And we're like, we're going to do our best. Uh, and so anyhow, we ended up stumbling our way uh, through this. And in so doing, we developed a depth of relationship with a carrier that has continued to be really good to us, which is pure private client. And so uh, in a really hard situation for an elderly couple that was totally overwhelmed, I remember her signing my work off and her hand was shaking and it was just so emotional. Um, it was such a great lesson for me and for the team. And it kind of served as foundational for what we do at EPC, which is the true measure of success is to earn a hug from the policyholder by the end of the job. And by the time that closed out and we brought all the contents back, I flew back up there and we had earned that hug. And then I thought, this is a good business. And I, it got me really excited about contents because there's a certain emotional connection that emerges between a policyholder and contents. Uh, that doesn't necessarily exist with a policyholder in drywall or millwork. Does that make sense? Yes. Love my drywall. Yeah, Love yeah, my drywall. yeah. But I find that people are a little bit more passionate about their Steinway. So I, I don't know if that was funny, but it it did. Uh, it's true, and it's one of the very first jobs, and I think it set a lot of things in motion today that were foundational for emergency backup. Co. So. Fantastic. I'm not a funny Perfect. guy. Sorry. Phil. Yeah, you know what? That's okay because that was a great story. It was a great. Do, story. do you want to wrap us up, Michelle? I don't know if there's anything to wrap up. This was super fun. Yeah. Stay tuned for more. Phil and I are hoping to record these at shows. So if there's somebody you want to hear from, or I think everybody watching needs to start thinking about their funny, their oh, yeah. interesting yeah, job right. stories. Yeah, like yeah. start thinking, because we're going to ask you. All right. Thank <laughs> you both gentlemen. Oh, yeah. I should turn it around That's just for that right. moment. We next yeah, time, I think we need a camera pointing right. the other that'd direction. Be, that'd be and then we, room. that'd be really cool actually to get the okay. people waving and the, we're going to work on this technology. Yes. All right. Yeah. Yes. All right, gentlemen, thank you. Right. you know, yep, I got it all. It's a wrap. Thank you very much. Keep going.